This program is made possible by the giving of the God Called Partners of Renner Ministries. Hey friends, this is Rick Renner. Here I am with my wonderful team. We've traveled all the way to Eastern Turkey and today we're standing on the probable ruins of the real Noah's Ark. And we've come all the way here because we're teaching a series called Fallen Angels, Giants, Monsters, and the World Before the Flood and Why God Sent the Flood. It is going to be amazing. And today we're going to see the link of mythological monsters to the Bible. And we're going to go to Genesis chapter six. Stay with me, it's going to be great. Hey friends, here I am still seated on the ruins of Noah's Ark. Now somebody might say, are you really sure? Well, maybe we'll call it the probable ruins, but for me, these really are the ruins of Noah's Ark. I've been here, scientists have been here. This site has been scanned and scanned and scanned and directly below me are right angle formations, which you do not find in nature, which means there are rooms underneath this. And not just rooms, but we know there are three levels. And according to Genesis chapter six, there were three different floors in the ark. And this structure exactly matches the dimensions which are given to us in Genesis chapter six. It is amazing. But the reason that God sent the flood is because nefarious angels sinned with women who gave birth to giants. But there's another very ancient book, which is called the Book of Enoch. And the Book of Enoch is not scripture, but it is a very serious historical commentary that was even used by members of Jesus' family. Jesus quoted the Book of Enoch. His brother James quoted the Book of Enoch. His brother Jude quoted the Book of Enoch. Peter quoted the Book of Enoch. And in the Book of Enoch, we find that these nefarious angels not only slept with women, but they also defiled the animals. They slept with animals. And that is where mythological creatures come from in all kinds of legends around the world. My friends, the ancient peoples did not just have overactive imaginations. What they believed was really rooted in a historical event. And that event occurred in Genesis chapter six, when fallen angels slept with women who produced giants, and they also defiled the animals, sleeping with animals, which then produced monsters in the earth. And that is what I'm going to show you today. Stay tuned for a teaching you can trust, a message that will inspire, strengthen, and equip you with vital insights and understanding from the Word of God. Here is Rick. Hey, welcome to the program. My name is Rick Renner and I've been waiting for you. And today we're gonna to return to the amazing subject, fallen angels, giants, monsters, and the world before the flood. We've already looked at giants, but today we're gonna to be looking at the monsters that roamed the earth before the flood. And I think you're going to be quite amazed. But I'm teaching you from my brand new series, which is 15 parts, and it's called Fallen Angels, Giants, Monsters, and the World Before the Flood. You say, Rick, why are you teaching on this? Well, first of all, I find it extremely interesting. But secondly, in Matthew chapter 24, verse 37, Jesus says, as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be before the coming of the Son of Man. So we need to understand what was happening before the flood in the days of Noah, because Jesus said many of those events will be repeated at the end of the age. And that is why I'm teaching you on this subject. But anyway, this is 15 parts and it comes with a wonderful study guide. My friends, the study guide is so loaded. It's like we have set a banquet on the table in front of you. All you have to do is pull up a chair, dive in and eat. And by reading the study guide, while you see or hear the series, you really get the teaching down deep inside you. And right now we're offering you a book that I did not write. It's the book that I wish I had written, but it's by Dr. Dennis Lindsay. And the name of the book is <clears throat> Giants, Fallen Angels, and the Return of the Nephilim. 
This book is so riveting. I read it in one setting from cover to cover. It definitely will spur your thinking and make you ask questions, and then you'll find the answers to your questions in this book. It is just amazing. It's about the past. It's about the present. It's about the future. And I really want you to have this book. And by the way, you can order all these things by going online or by giving us a call right now. And when you reach out to us, please let us know how to pray for you because we are people of prayer. And if you'll reach out to us by calling or going online, you'll find out that you're going to meet people that are going to really, really pray for you. And Jesus is going to do something wonderful for you as a result. But hey, reach for your Bible because we always use the Bible in this program. But today, I'm going to talk to you about monsters. What about monsters? The whole series is called Fallen Angels, Giants, Monsters, and the World Before the Flood. Well, you know, modern man talks about ancient mythology, but you know, to the ancient civilizations, it was not mythology. To the early Greeks and Romans and other early cultures, they really considered these things to be real, and for them, they were not the byproduct of fantasy or a wild imagination. And in fact, if you look at the vast number of pagan temples that are dedicated to various gods, the money they invested in building them and embellishing them, and the way they offered sacrifices and libations to the gods, my friends, it is very evident they really believed in those gods. And of course, we know that the real origin of those gods is in Genesis chapter 6, when the sons of God who were mutinous angels came down. And of course, when those mutinous angels came down, they were celestial beings. And your early man, it looked like the gods had come down from the heavens. And in fact, that is the root of all pagan mythology. All pagan religions, all of them, have their roots in Genesis chapter 6. They may use different names. They may tell the stories a little bit different. But if you look, there's a similarity between all of them. And all of them, my friend, are rooted in Genesis chapter 6, verses 1 and 2 and verse 4. But they really believe that these were gods. And the early people believed that they controlled the universe, they controlled human faith, and that they directed the natural world around them. And that's why they brought them offerings and libations and sacrifices. Wow. But if you think that the early civilizations were just primitive and just had wild imaginations, I want you to remember that even today we are impacted by those earlier civilizations. They developed logic, philosophy, poetry, history, science, mathematics, literature, art, and architecture. My friends, these were the founders of civilization. And in fact, they had such advanced technology, they were able to build structures which survived the flood that are still with us today. And when people today look at them, we don't even know how they built them. For example, the pyramids. Ay, ay, ay. Or you can go to South America where you see amazing structures actually all over the world, structures which were built with very high technology. And we know from what we've already seen that when these mutinous angels came down into the earth, not only did they lay with women and produce giants, and today you're going to find out monsters, but they also imparted technological skills. You know today, there's a lot of talk on TV and YouTube and other sources about ancient aliens, and people say the ancient aliens came and they built all these structures and imparted technology. Well, in one sense, they're right because someone did come to impart technology, but it wasn't aliens. It was mutinous angels. The Bible gives us the answer. We don't have to wonder who they were. But is it really possible that people with such advanced civilizations and sophistication and information and education really could have just believed something that was concocted by their wild imagination? The answer is no. They really believed these things. And my friends, you know, I talk a lot about Greek. The Greeks had their versions of mythology and the Romans, but not just the Greeks and the Romans. There were the Persians, the Babylonians, the Chaldeans, the Sumerians, the Egyptians, the Romans, and as far away as India and other ancient cultures, all of them basically tell the same stories with just a little variation. They talk about winged creatures. 
They talk about celestial beings which came down out of the heaven and almost all of them in every culture say that these beings philandered with women and produced unusual children, demigods, giants. All of these cultures basically tell the same story, but we know it all started in Genesis chapter 6, verses 1 and 2 and verse 4. Now, you may ask, well, how did these stories get spread to so many cultures? Well, Noah and his sons and his daughter-in-laws, they all knew these stories because that's why the flood came. And when they exited the ark, they carried all that history with them, and they carried the earliest sections of the book of Enoch, the book of Jubilees, the book of the Watchers, the book of the Giants, all of those were carried onto the ark and they exited with them. And finally, when God scattered all the nations at the Tower of Babel and the languages were confused and men began to travel across the face of the earth, they took these stories with them, which were real history. And over time, these stories began to change. Some legends were added. But basically, again, if you look in all these places where people migrated, they all carried the essential bare bones of the same story, and all of it has its beginning in Genesis chapter 6, verses 1, verses 2, and verse 4, which tells us angels came down, mutinous angels who abandoned their post. Well, what was their post? God sent them into the earth after the fall of man to be watchers, to watch over fallen man, and to help fallen man, isn't that just like God? God is so good, he's always wanting to help us. But we know from history, from Genesis chapter 6, and from writings in the book of Enoch. You say, well, what is the book of Enoch? The book of Enoch is not a biblical book, but it's a very ancient book, and most scholars believe it predated the flood. That's amazing, which means Noah carried it onto the ark with him, at least the earliest chapters. Well, it was written by his great-grandfather, <clears throat> Enoch. So, of course, he wanted to carry those revelations with him onto the ark. And it makes me want to ask you, are you carrying revelation from one generation to another generation? We need to. That's what Noah did. And when he exited the ark, he exited with those writings. And we know from the book of Enoch, which again is not Bible, but it is so serious as an ancient history book that Jesus quoted it, Peter quoted it, Jude quoted it, James quoted it. We know the Apostle Paul quoted it, John quoted it. Nearly all of the biblical writers quoted something from the book of Enoch. And the book of Enoch tells us categorically that these angels came down and cohabitated with women. They left their posts as watchers and they begin to pursue strange flesh, which we saw two programs ago. And yesterday, we saw what ancient sources had to say about all of this. And it is amazing how much confirmation of all of these things were written by early fathers of the church. But let's go back to Genesis chapter 6 and verse 1 and begin there today. And it says, And it came to pass when the Men begin to multiply on the face of the earth. And we saw already that there were several million men by this time. And daughters were born unto them, verse 2, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair, and they took them wives of all that they chose. This phrase, sons of God, is an old phrase from the Old Testament which describes the angels. It's used multiple times in the Old Testament. And if you read the Old Testament Septuagint Greek version of those scriptures, it actually describes them as angels. It says the sons of God in the King James Version, but the Septuagint says angels. It clearly is a description of angels. And now we know they are mutinous angels. And a large number of scholars agree more than disagree that this phrase, sons of God, really refers to angels, or in this case, fallen angels, who left their abandoned posts, entered into the atmosphere of the earth to have sexual relationships with women. And now I'm going to reference 1 Enoch chapter 6, verses 1 through 8, which I've already read to you, but it's very foundational 
to what I'm teaching. And here is Enoch's commentary on this event. Verse 1, And it came to pass, after the children of men had increased in those days, beautiful and comely daughters were born to them. Verse 2, And the angels, the sons of the heaven, saw and lusted after them, and said one to another, Behold, we will choose for ourselves wives from among the children of men, and will beget for ourselves children. Verse 3, And Zim Jaza, that was the chief leader of the mutinous angels, who was their leader, said to them, I fear that perhaps you will not be willing to do this deed, and I alone will suffer for this great sin. Verse 4, And they all answered him and said, We will all swear an oath and bind ourselves mutually by a curse that we will not give up this plan, but we will make this plan a deed. Verse 5, and they all swore together and bound themselves mutually by a curse, and together there were 200 of them. Verse 6, and they descended on Artis, which is the summit of Mount Hermon, and they called it Mount Hermon because they had sworn on it and bound themselves mutually by a curse. Verse 7, and these are the names of their leaders. Simjaza, who was their leader, or this was the leader of the angels who led this mutiny. Then it lists all the other angels, which I'm not going to read. But then you get to verse 8, and it says, And these are the leaders of the 200 angels and the others that were with them. All ancient mythology begins right here. And again, the religions of the Babylonians, all the ancient religions in the Near East, even the religions of the Egyptians and the Greeks and the Romans and those in India, even the religion of the Vikings is rooted right here in Genesis chapter 6 when these fallen angels, these winged creatures, descended from above to have relationships with women, and the women then began to produce giants. Wow. And this is emphatically the root for legends like Zeus and the Olympian gods the gods of Olympus. But rather than being on Mount Hermon, the Greek says they were on Mount Olympus. But it's the very same story, just different names. Wow. And as I stated earlier, these sophisticated, well-developed, highly advanced civilizations really believed these things. And my friends, all of these various religions said that the gods who came down are these winged creatures philandered with women who produced Giants. Now that is amazing. But when you read the book of Enoch, you find that not only did the angels sleep with women, but they also defiled the animals. And as a result of them sexually defiling animals, the animals gave birth to monsters. That's why I called the whole series Fallen Angels, Giants, Monsters, and the World Before the flood. Now that is just amazing. Just like the women gave birth to giants, which is the Hebrew word Nephilim, it describes fallen ones. These were corrupted breed. One ancient writer called them a demon brood. They were monstrous creatures, horrible creatures, which the King James Version translates as giants. Apparently, the fallen angels also slept with animals or defiled the animals, and the animals gave birth to giants. Now, many legends have been added to this over thousands of years, but the fact is, when you look at early history and all the various religions, all the early religions from various civilizations tell stories nearly about the same kinds of monstrous creatures. Well, let me read to you from Enoch chapter 7, parts of verses 1 to verse 6. Here it is again. And they, that is the angels, took unto themselves wives, and each of them chose for himself one, and began to go into them, and mixed with them, and taught them charms and conjurations, and made them acquire with the, uh, skills cutting of roots and of woods, and they became pregnant and brought forth giants. They devoured all the acquisitions of mankind till men were unable to sustain themselves, and the giants turned themselves against mankind in order to devour them, and then they begin to sin against the animals. One ancient record says they begin to defile the animals, and here we find a form of bestiality when the angels begin to sleep with strange flesh, which were animals. And it seems 
that as a result, animals begin to give birth to strange creatures or monsters. And again, if you look all over the world in all ancient civilizations, you find that all of them seem to have the same monstrous creatures just with different names. For example, there is Argus, a monstrous creature with as many as a hundred eyes that were located all over his body. Or how about Ambit, an Egyptian creature with the head of a crocodile, the forelimbs of a lion, and with the hind limbs of a hippopotamus. Or how about Apkala, a Babylonian creature with human features, with the scales of a fish, and with the wings of a bird. Or how about Apep, an Egyptian creature that looked like a snake that stretched for 50 feet from head to tail? Or how about the centaur, a half man, half horse creature whose upper half looked human, but its lower half had the four legs of a horse? Or how about Severus, a monstrous dreaded three-headed dog? Or how about Chimera? a giant creature with body parts like a goat, a lion, and a snake. Or how about dragons? They're seen in all ancient cultures. Or how about Ikinda, called the mother of all monsters that look like half woman and half snake. Or griffins, who are a combination of lion and eagle with the body of a lion and with the head and wings and talons of an eagle. Or hydra, a horrible and terrifying creature that had nine heads that looked like the heads of dragons. Or how about Lamashtu, a Babylonian creature with a hairy body, a lioness head, and with donkey's teeth and ears and long fingernails and the feet of a bird and sharp talons, or Manticore, a Babylonian Persian man-eater that had the head of a man, the body of a lion, and the tails of a scorpion, or how about the Manitar, a famous half-man, half-bull creature that ate people, or Python, a feared dragon-type creature, or a satyr, a half Half man, half goat creature that sexually seduced and sexually abused women, and it just goes on and on and on and on and on. Well, these names change from culture to culture. But my friends, I remind you again that the people who wrote of these things were highly advanced. They were the creators of many of the sciences of which we still use today, and these were not people given to wild imaginations. They wrote about things they really believe occurred. And it seems that just like the mutinous angels slept, like, went, slept with women who gave birth to giants, they also defiled the animals, and the animals produced monsters, and these monsters really roamed the earth before the flood. Wow. As a result, the earth was filled with Nephilim, and the earth was filled with unnatural creatures, which were the offspring of the fallen mutinous angels who intermingled with women and animals. And when you come to Genesis chapter 6, verse 5, it says, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was evil only, verse 6. And it repented the Lord that he made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And verse 7 says, And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man, look at this, both man and beast and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air, for it repented me that I have made them. All flesh of every kind had become corrupted because of these mutinous angels which slept with women and seemed to have also sexually defiled animals. Now that may be something you've never heard before. But hey, we're out of time, but I'll be back in just a moment, and I'm going to pray for you. Finally, Rick Renner has unlocked the mystery surrounding the sons of God and the giants that appeared in the earth before the flood during the days of Noah. To film this riveting series, Fallen Angels, Giants, Monsters, and the World Before the Flood, Rick and his team traveled to eastern Turkey to the ruins of Noah's Ark. In this series, Rick dives deep into the scriptures to give you answers about who are the sons of God in Genesis 6, 1 and 2? What does the promise of 120 years really mean? Where is the real location of Noah's Ark today? Rick says, this is the series I've wanted to teach for decades. With the research we conducted at the real Noah's Ark, along with amazing historical records, I believe this long-awaited series will answer a multitude of questions for people who have wondered about the strange events that occurred before the 
the flood and what Jesus said about them being repeated at the end of the age. This 15-part series is available in digital or physical formats, starting at just $24. In addition, we're offering Dennis Lindsay's astounding book, Giants, Fallen Angels, and the Return of the Nephilim. This book will amaze you and open your mind to mysteries hidden in the Bible that have great impact on our world today. This book can be yours for $20. Don't delay. Order this bundle of the 15-part series, Fallen Angels, Giants, Monsters, and the World Before the Flood, and the book, Giants, Fallen Angels, and the Return of the Nephilim. Call the number on your screen or go to renner.org to order. Call or go online now. Hey friends, this is Rick Renner and I'm standing outside the new TV studio in Moscow. Praise God, most of the interior is already finished. They're still working on Denise's studio, so pray for us as we continue, it's gonna be nice. And if you see the big bulldozer behind me, that's because they're getting ready to do the parking lot. You know, winter comes pretty early in our part of the world, so we need to really seize the moment and get this parking done before the cold weather sets in. But hey, we're making progress and praise God, the studio is paid for. This is all paid for. And I wanna say thank you for being the most amazing partners and helping us with this. And now, the project in front of us is to pay off the Tulsa facility. We want to retire the debt on the big office complex in Tulsa because when that's paid off, suddenly all those finances are gonna be released for us to go on more TV and minister to people all over the world. My friends, the Bible tells us in Proverbs 10, 21, that the lips of the righteous feed many. I know that's my assignment, to feed as many people the Word of God as possible, and I'm doing it with you. Wow, thank you for being a partner. You're part of the giving team that's helping us make amazing progress. And if you're not a part of the giving team yet, please pray about joining us to retire the debt on the Tulsa building. It's not about buildings. It's just about having the space we need so that we can effectively minister to people. We want to retire that debt so we can take the Word of God to more parts of the world where people are crying out for teaching they can trust. And I want to say thank you for everything you do. I am so excited that we're studying this subject together because the Bible provides so many answers to mysteries. You watch the internet, you watch television, you watch YouTube, and people try to concoct all kinds of fantastical answers to events they can't understand, when in fact the answers are right in the Bible beginning in Genesis chapter 6, verses 1, 2, and 4. And I want you to have the whole series because it is just jam-packed, all 15 parts. And again, the series is called Fallen Angels, Giants, Monsters, and the World Before the Flood. And it comes with a study guide. And we're also offering you Dennis Lindsay's book, which is called Giants, Fallen Angels, and the Return of the Nephilim. But quickly let me pray for you. Father, I thank you that you're causing the Word of God to come alive in each of us. Help us, Lord, to learn the Bible is truly reliable and always true on every subject in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, I'll see you in the next program. Thank you for watching this broadcast. For more information on product resources or to learn how you can partner with this ministry, please connect with us at renner.org. Also, please be sure to visit us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. This program was made possible by the giving of the God-called partners of Renner Ministries.